everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment if you'd like to grab your seat. I'd like to start by thanking you for coming out tonight and saying we're fortunate to come together on Treaty 4 territory for what will be a wonderful evening. My name is Michelle Stewart and I am in the Faculty of Arts. I'm here speaking as the representative for the committee that recommended Dr. Cindy Blackstock as our speaker this year. My comments will be brief and I will soon be inviting up Dr. Shawnee Pete to formally introduce and welcome Cindy to campus. Prior to that I will share just a few words about this annual speaker series. Supported by the Woodrow Lloyd Trust and presented annually by the University of Regina's Faculty of Arts, the Woodrow Lloyd Lecture recognizes the outstanding contributions of former Saskatchewan Premier Woodrow Lloyd to the fields of education and social welfare. As many of you know, Woodrow Lloyd's career included time as a teacher, president of the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation, as well as being a member of the Legislative Assembly, serving as the Minister of Education, Treasurer, and eventually the Premier of the province, succeeding Tommy Douglas. As Premier, he was involved in Saskatchewan's Universal Health Care Plan, implementing the program ushered in by Douglas and weathering the infamous doctor strike of 1962. In honour of the outstanding public service and personal career of Woodrow Lloyd, each year a nationally recognised scholar, writer, thinker or activist is invited to the University of Regina by the Faculty of Arts to deliver a public lecture about an event or issue of particular relevance in Saskatchewan. Cindy's work is a magnificent example of the people we aspire to bring to our campus. On behalf of the committee, I want to thank her for coming tonight and spending time with you, as well as our colleagues and students during her visit. I would like to make one note, per Cindy's request, that she is unable to assist in individual cases or concerns. She's asking that these types of issues that need specific assistance that you would take it up with the local social services office and or contact the Saskatchewan Advocate for Children and Youth to best get help with your case. I'm now going to turn things over to Shawneen and thank you once again for coming tonight. I'm getting older and I realize now I have to write things down. <laughs> Welcome. And I want to acknowledge that we have the great privilege of gathering tonight in Treaty 4 territory um, and that this is uh, the location where so many nations came together to visit and to live and to trade with one another and that our history is steeped in the histories of a variety of First Nations and Métis people. And so in this place, um, we want to recognize that we need to begin in a good way. And so I'd like to start by asking Noel Starblanket to say a prayer to open this event on our behalf. I'll ask you uh, to remain sitting, Noel. Would that be appropriate, or do you wish them to stand? They can sit, he says. You can sit. <laughs> So Norrell, I have tobacco for you, and I ask that you say prayers for all of us and the work we, we do together, but in particular for Cindy, who so, fought so many battles on her own, often in, in isolation from other people, and we pray that she has strength and she continues the good work, and that we will all be inspired by her words tonight to do our part to create change for our First Nations and Métis children. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Just by way of explanation, uh, my teachings are that we uh, humble ourselves as human beings to uh, our mother, uh, Mother Earth. Indeed, this university has adopted that concept in their strategic plan, Peyakaski uh, Kikawi now. And uh, so in that light, uh, ask you to honor uh, our mother and and also our great father creator so uh, 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 I will not use the mic when I pray so uh, I ask you to join me as I do when I'm asked to do this uh, think about these things uh, to give thanks for uh, for life uh, for our livelihood for our work uh, for good fortune and uh, for good health. We ask the Creator for these things and then uh, we ask uh, the Creator's helpers, you may know them as angels, in our culture we know them as uh, grandfathers and grandmothers. 
and we ask those ones to uh, also to intercede on our behalf, as I will do uh, with this tobacco. So uh, join me now, if you would, please. Uh, I'll say this in my language. Dr. Cindy Blackstock, Matei Siwichinan, the box of a kakio, Tauima, Matei Siwichinan, Pematsuin, Pematsuin, Etuskewin, Papewi, when Mina Mio Masuin, Mina Nistan to Max and Anno Tauima, Matei Siwichinan, Ego Mina Kakio Skaya Kumuta, Anno Somatipska, Mami Wipiwa Kumuta, Matei Siwichinan, the box of Mina Wistawa, Matei Siwichi. Ego mina kahkia wato yaga namo somna nak no kumna nak mina wista wao iso watso na wao kia wao matei si kake sumuta tao na wao kahkia wao noa kumaga na nak mina doctor shani in fi tego mina doctor cindy blackstock te mak so wak matei si kake sumuta tao na wao somna nak no kumna nak nas kumten ni nas kumten na wao kahkia wato yaga hai hai thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. I'm reminded as you share your words with us that when we come together in this way, uh, the recognition that we are really truly working together to try and create a new pathway forward. And in order to do that, we have to begin in a, in a place of goodness and a place of generosity and a place of hope. And prayer helps us to clear our minds from the busyness of the day. It helps us to become grounded and focused and it helps us all to breathe from one breath and so that we can uh, move forward in a, in a good way with one another. I've... Uh, had the great privilege of, of knowing Cindy for, for a long time. I, I don't know if you remember, we met probably 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when you were with the Center um, of Excellence for Child Welfare, and I was with the Center of Excellence for Youth Engagement. Um, I was always inspired by Cindy, her compassion, but also her direct way of speaking about the things that she's passionate about. And certainly, I have nothing but great respect for your work as an academic and as a scholar, um, as a public intellectual. You've been very generous with your gifts. Uh, she's uh, been able to um, create over 60 publications that help change the fields of child welfare, that help us to think about counseling and, and uh, supports for children and youth. And her key interests, of course, have always been centered on the systemic disadvantage of Aboriginal children and their families and how those, uh, those systemic disadvantages must be addressed. They must be corrected in order for healthier families to emerge and healthier uh, communities to emerge. I said earlier when I asked Noel to, to bestow prayers upon you, that I also recognize that your advocacy work has often left you exposed, that sometimes and many times that you've traveled this path by yourself. And while we can be um, standing behind you and respecting you, we, and we have to also acknowledge that when great leaders emerge, they take on great risk. And certainly I respect that you've taken on great personal risk. You might know that um, Cindy filed a complaint against the federal government which resulted in a human rights tribunal. She argued that the federal government had knowingly underfunded First Nations Child and Family Services in Canada and repeatedly had set up roadblocks that hampered the proceedings through their denial and through their dismissal and through their inaction. But she was consistent and she was powerful and she was very um, determined to correct this wrongdoing that uh, currently exists in our country. In recognition of her persistence and in recognition of showing thanks and gratitude uh, for the gifts that people share with us, we have a gift for you tonight that I would like to ask my colleague, Angela Snowshoe, and uh, one of our students, Michaela, if they'll help me to bestow upon you. Cindy? Oh, you brought out here to that. <laughs> 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 
Cindy, in our, in our territories, we like to recognize the efforts of individuals through the gifting of a blanket. And this beautiful star blanket actually was from Noel. Noel donated it this evening, and I'm very thankful for this beautiful, beautiful gift. And we're so pleased that we can share it with you tonight in recognition of your leadership. You have to know that how you've inspired so many Indigenous women to be more powerful and persistent in their own leadership. And you've touched our lives, and we're thankful for that. We're completely thankful for what you do. And we need to be inspired by her actions. We must be more than what we've given to date. We must continue to give more. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So we like to start with the good stuff <laughs> and make sure that we, uh, we do things in a good way because it also brings us joy. It brings us joy to be generous and to share our gifts. That's a message I heard from Cindy today. Cindy's current professional interests include acting as an expert advisor to UNICEF on the UN Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and holding fellowships with the Atkinson Foundation, the Ashoka Foundation, and the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation. Cindy Blackstock is one of Canada's greatest leaders. It's an honor to introduce her tonight. It's an honor for... Um, for me to share this stage with her, even if for just a brief moment, and I can't tell you how excited and thrilled I am to hear you once again. Um, and I wish you the best of luck in everything that you're doing in the future, and I, I know you're eager to hear her, um, but you'll have to wait one more moment. <laughs> In order to also greet uh, Cindy in, in a good way, uh, Riva uh, farrell Reset is here tonight, and she will be um, offering up a song prior to Cindy's presentation. Riva. Hi. I don't know if this is, I've got some high tech, ooh, it's totally working. <laughs> um, so I wrote a song called I Am A Witness in 2010, and I wrote it um, in my second year law school. And that was after working eight years on reserve so I spent eight years working in a system that basically gave children and communities less for the sole, the only reason was because it was a school on reserve. Children are entitled to less only because they live on reserve. And um, <clears throat> I was attending an Aboriginal law ceremony, uh, not ceremony, Aboriginal law seminar and um, some students were presenting on the child welfare situation and the chronic underfunding of child welfare systems on, uh, on reserve. And I noticed that, well, I just immediately identified with the situation because it's a mere situation um, for teachers or for education on reserve. And uh, at the end of the presentation, the students passed out these buttons that said, I am a witness. And I just thought, well, that's going to be the first line to this song. So um, <clears throat> I suppose the one other thing I wish to say quickly is that cases like this that Cindy is advancing does so much for the law in Canada because the legal test as in discrimination, the way they stand right now, entitles the Canadian government to sit back and say, we're not discriminating because we are treating everyone Basically, well, the effect is we're treating everyone equally as poorly, so we're not discriminating. And that just should not fly in Canada. everything that you want to hide 
take to bed with you each night I am a witness of something so obvious I can see everything it's your word hide hold your hands up Ever felt left behind? Could you stand up to show how your hands are tied? Cause in our schools, you would find little pieces of the crown you take, the crown you take to bed with you each night. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Thank you, Riva. And now for Dr. Cindy Blackstock, if you can give me a hand in welcoming her to the stage. What a great honor to be here tonight at a time when we have history happening on our front door. Know it or not, each one of you is living at the moment when we all together before Canada's 150th birthday, are going to put an end to the long-standing discrimination by the Canadian government to children. It's going to take all of you. And one thing I know about children is that they are sacred to all of us. I think in that's way why this story is so appealing to people across different beliefs, different political positions. Because we may be very proud of our jobs and the different roles we pay in life, but for most of us, truly the most sacred thing that we are is a mom, a brother, a sister, or a grandfather to a child. Children have an enormous power. They may not be experts in law or in medicine or education, but they are experts in love and fairness. There is no better hug you will ever get in your life than from a five-year-old. They remind us of what's truly important in life. They make us want to do better, to will a world to them that's better than the one that was willed to us. And the best place for all children to grow up is with their families, in their family homes, in the places where their parents grew up where they will hear the stories about what it was like when you were little, where they will ask you questions that sometimes you don't know how to handle, where they smell the smells of the cooking and the songs that you play on your DVD player. And that's where most children need to grow up. But sadly for some children, that's not where they grow up. And because children can see things so clearly, I tend to spend a lot of time hanging out with them. Because they make more sense than adults do. <laughs> they really do. And uh, I was walking along with my dear friend Charlene Bearhead with an eight-year-old girl in Ottawa. She was a non-Aboriginal girl. Uh, her brother did this beautiful artwork behind you. You can see that. And uh, we were walking upon a house. And there were some workers there laying sod. And um, they said, and she asked us, she said, can you guys see what they're doing? And of course, being adults, we were able to fish up an answer. Yes, we said. They're laying sod. She said, no, that's not what they're doing. 
It's not what they're doing. She said they're trying to make it beautiful. And what happens in that house is not beautiful for children. The house she was talking about is the House of Commons. So what does an eight-year-old know about the House of Commons that many caring Canadians are just starting to come to understand? Well, she knew from one of her heroes, Shannon Kustachin, that children on reserve get less. What a lot of people don't know is that although provincial territorial laws on child welfare, health and education apply on reserves, and that's a matter of controversy itself, because let's face it, those laws haven't served those children that well. But nonetheless, they apply. But the federal government is supposed to fund those services. And dating right back to the very beginnings of the relationship between First Nations and the government of Canada, from residential schools forward, they have always given First Nations children less, and they've always told non-Aboriginal people that they're actually giving us more. A nine-year-old girl gave me the best definition of discrimination. She said, discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. So what does it feel like to be a person who's not worth the money? What does it feel like to be a child who's not worth the money? Well, one of the things we need to do is peel back the layers of history of Canada. What you're seeing before you is a warrant. It is dated 1895. It's commissioned by Duncan Campbell Scott. We just had the whole celebration, if you'd like to call it, of John A. Macdonald, right? Um, and he was an architect of residential schools, and Scott was his chief administrator. Now, what a lot of people know about residential schools, of course, is that it was the removal of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children and placing them in education facilities, which were really assimilation. But what a lot of people don't know, and a lot of social workers don't even know, is that these were the earliest child welfare placements in the country. This warrant allowed for the removal of Indian children because they were not properly cared for. And that did not mean that they weren't loved. It didn't mean that they weren't physically cared for or spiritually cared for. It was that they were being raised as First Nations children. The next pages of this document have a series of blanks where the Indian agent would have written in the names of thousands of children in future generations, the thousands of children that in 2008 the Prime Minister would apologize for, the thousands of children whose memories are etched in the exhibit here at the University of Regina. So child welfare in residential schools are linked. By 1967, in Saskatchewan, 80% of the children in residential schools were placed there as child welfare placements. Placed there by people like me, social workers, who sat on those admission committees. Throughout the entire history of residential schools, although there were public reports of the harms of children, and even people like physicians and lawyers speaking out about them, there's not one report of a social worker ever doing a child protection investigation in the schools. Never. The only one I remember is actually a social worker writing a letter saying that the kids who go home for the summer should have their parents assessed to see if they're safe. The social worker working in writing that letter worked in St. Anne's residential school that had the electric chair. There's no reflection on the system doing the harm. No reflection on the system doing the harm. And we can hear that these echoes of this old system are coming forward. I know there's lots of definitions of reconciliation, but for me, reconciliation means not saying sorry twice. And Sheila Fraser's documented these inequalities in child welfare, in education and health, going back well over a decade. The federal government is well aware that it's underfunding these services. And as you're about to see in some of the evidence before the tribunal, they even know what the effect of it is. But they're choosing not to do it. They're choosing not to do it. So why is it that in a country that prides itself on democracy, that often says we were the architects of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that this nonsense has gone on? This racial discrimination against a generation of kids has survived up until the time we sit here. How has that happened? I think it's an important question, but a couple of the things that I've come up with are that governments have sold Canadians on a wrong bill of goods. 
When you hear them talk about these problems, they will say a couple of things. First of all, that First Nations are too remote. That's why we can't fix things. Do you ever notice that the only time they talk about remoteness is when they're talking about people? You will never see any politician say, that uranium is too remote. <laughs> we had a guy twittering from space. <laughs> one guy. Next one is, First Nations are too complex. The whole situation is too complex. Well, I would argue that equality isn't complex, but maintaining a regime of discrimination is. And when we have one in six First Nations children in their communities who can't even turn on a uh, tap to get a clean glass of water, but we can send a DART team halfway around the world to get clean water uh, uh, pumping in an earthquake zone in 24 hours, that's not that complex. Giving kids a fair chance of childhood is not complex. And then we have the good old one, if all we run through all those and they don't work, that First Nations aren't very good at managing their money. It's kind of like it's a cultural characteristic and we have to have accountability before we give them more money. Now, it's interesting for me because there are First Nations people who are bad money managers and there are some that probably commit fraud. Uh, I live in Ottawa and over to the east we have Montreal. <laughs> And uh, sadly, to the West, until very recently, we had Rob Ford. <laughs> but nobody went running to Parliament to pass an Accountability Act before the federal transfers went into those communities. We need to question that racism, those stereotypes that stop us from looking deeper. And on our side as First Nations people, we have come accustomed to incremental equality. What do I mean by that? is that the deficit is so big, we're grateful next year that we get one school. We really need 50 schools, but we're happy we at least get one. And we don't want to tick off the government because they may not even give us that one school. The problem with incremental equality is it never comes. I have a typewritten report in my office. It says, can anyone hazard a guess as to what year or what century real equality will happen for Indian children in education? That was written in 1967 when I was three years old and we are still at it. Equality in a country as wealthy as Canada needs to be the floor, not the ceiling. It needs to be the floor, not the ceiling. And we know equality is better for everybody. One of the books I think should be mandatory reading for everyone is The Spirit Level. And there's a great website called gapminder.org that says, if someone like me were to take over being prime minister, and let's face it, I think it's time for a gal to take over that post. <laughs> huh? It's not going to be me because I'm not interested in politics, but one of you will run. I would actually just do one thing. I would focus on reducing the inequalities in our own country. Why? Because the best research says that if you want to reduce crime rates, reduce mental health rates, reduce substance misuse, increase, decrease youth suicide rates, increase the wellness of your community, increase trust and not have to build more prisons, and you want a better economy, you reduce the inequality. And we saw this just with actually with President Obama's speech to the nation just yesterday, where he's talking about this very perilous situation we have with a very small percentage of the world owning half of the wealth of the world. And that brings down to think the whole trickle-down economics thing. Who still believes that, other than politicians? Do we really believe that they are going to take care of us if we make the rich even richer? Election time is happening in Ottawa. I live right in the Byward Market. I see the Prime Minister's motorcade take by my house on a regular day. We're actually neighbours, Stephen Harper and I. I don't know if he knows that, but we are. <laughs> and um, what I'm hearing from all the parties these days is vote for me because we care about the economy and jobs. And what was so interesting about that, they, they think that what we're worried about as Canadians is jobs and terrorism. But when they asked that question to people on CBC, 76% said they weren't worried about either. I bet that 76% was worried about their kids, the families, the environment, and the type of values we have for the country. 
But nonetheless, if this whole idea that they're going to look after us if we vote for them and we get good jobs is right, shouldn't our kids be doing as well as our GDP? So we are the 11th wealthiest country in the world. 11th wealthiest. And the Kids' Rights Foundation did a very interesting thing. I love that foundation. It partners with the Nobel laureates every year. It gives out the International Children's Peace Prize that I was so honored to nominate Shannon Kustachin for from the Attawapiskat First Nation. And also that Malala won last year, right? So this is a very prestigious organization. They asked themselves a question that probably many of you do. When you turn on your radios, you're going to hear politicians saying, we're doing the very best we can for our kids. We love our kids. Standing by for the future. And I'm sure they believe that, but that's not what the data shows. When you ask yourself the question, how well is Canada doing for its children in proportion to our wealth? Where do you think we rank? 60th in the world. 6-0 in the world as an overall ranking. This should trouble anybody in the country. This is how well we're treating our future. The very best uh, investment any government can make is in kids. Not in people who are my age, but in children. For every dollar you invest in a child, you save $7 as a taxpayer downstream. And what you can see what we're doing is we're investing at 60th in the world. And our ranking in the Human Development Index is showing that. We're slipping steadily backwards, right? And if you look at the sub-index of where governments are really involved in legislation and in budgeting, we ranked 115th in the world in that sub-index. Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation were at 117th in the world. So Canada is not doing as well as Canada can do. Canada is doing as well as the Federation, Russian Federation is doing. And you have to ask yourselves as Canadians, is that really the society you want to will to your kids? Is this really the best that we can do as a people? Remember I was telling you of that little girl and she said that the best definition of discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. This is Jordan River Anderson. He was a baby born in 1995. His family lived in Norway House Cremation. He had to stay in hospital for the first two years of his life, medically required. But on finally, and I know many of you have spent time in hospital, you know how desperate you are to get open. Some of you have had children in hospital and know that time seems forever. The doctor said he could go home. But he wasn't able to go home because he was a First Nations child. So the government of Manitoba said, I don't want to pick up the health care costs because he's a federal responsibility. The federal government looked over all of its departments in Ottawa and said, we don't want to pick up this cost. We don't want to set up precedent of setting, uh, for paying for a First Nations kid. Could be the province's cost. So what did they decide to do? Leave this baby in the hospital while they argued over who should pay. Make, no, this is one fact that the Canadian government will not dispute. If Jordan was a non-Aboriginal child, he would have gone home at the age of two. He was in hospital not because he was sick. He was in hospital because he was a First Nations child. And he waited for these government officials to do the right thing. He actually waited for over two and a half years. And his sister and his father will often say that in the end, Jordan died of a broken heart. I don't need to tell you what many medical scientists already know, is that the spirit and the body are deeply connected. And after seeing so many boys who were sick come into the ward and get better and go home, and he was better and he was still in the hospital, things went downhill for Jordan. And he passed away at the age of five, never knowing what it is to live in a family home because of who he was. His family asked that this never happen to another child, and we knew it was all over the country. First Nations children were being told, no, or you have to wait in line because of who you are. We have to fight it out before we give you the services that other kids would get. So we created Jordan's Principle. It says, where a government service is available to all other kids, First Nations children should be able to access it on the same terms. It was a good day back in December of 2007 when it passed unanimously through the House. But Ernest Anderson, he was a smart man. He stood up and he said to the government, 
Don't let the good being done in my son's name today only be a moral victory. It'll only be right when you do the right thing for kids. And one of the things I'm going to ask you to do tonight is to sign on to Jordan's principle because the federal government has never implemented it. It began very quickly to narrow the definition to only children with complex medical needs with multiple service providers. It seemed that equality would have to wait for all other areas of children's experience. And they set up a system that was so crazy that it was difficult to access. Even for parents of children with multiple disabilities and complex medical problems. Meet one of the unsung heroes of Canada. Her name is Marina Beadle. Her proudest role in life is being a mother. She's a proud Mi'kmaq woman, a single parent of two boys. And she said, you know, you know that well, your most important job is your, when, a mom when you sleep lightly at night, in case your kid needs you. This is Jeremy. He is a very artistic child. He also has cerebral palsy and autism. Now, there are very few services off reserve for persons with disabilities, but imagine even receiving fewer on reserve. But Marina did, and she cared for him. Until one tragic day when Jeremy was 15 years old, she suffers a double stroke. So severe she can't hold a water glass, let alone help his physical care. She wants only one thing, and that is respite until she can get better and take over her responsibilities again. Off reserve, there's a Supreme Court in Nova Scotia decision saying, yes, if you were non-Aboriginal, you get that. The federal government said that Supreme Court decision didn't apply. They said, we're prepared to give you a fixed amount of care, even though healthcare professionals said that was far insufficient for Jeremy. And in emails that would come out in court action later, they spell out three options for Marina and for Jeremy. Number one, you can take this insufficient level of care we're providing. They acknowledge that medical people say there needed, was more was needed. And things could deteriorate so bad in the family home that child welfare could intervene and we'll pay for that. Or number two, on top of being an elder with a, who suffered a double stroke caring for a special needs child, she and the community could fundraise for the additional money. Or the third option was placing him in institutional care. What would any of you do in this audience, in her circumstance? She decided that it was time for her to take a stand at a time when she was most vulnerable. So she filed a legal action against the government of Canada saying that their interpretation of Jordan's principle was illegal, not just for Jeremy, but for all other kids. And the federal court agreed. The federal court ordered the federal government to pay for Jeremy's care. The federal government, however, appealed that ruling within 30 days. And um, guess who they wanted legal fees from? For over a year, they put her under that stress before on 4.30 on a Friday, they dropped the appeal. Now, the good news is Jeremy will receive the care he needs. The bad news is that behind the scenes, there are many children who are not. This is one of the documents we filed at the tribunal. It is an internal document written between Indian Affairs and Health Canada. It sets out examples of where they think kids on reserve are being shortchanged. You can see they're describing here a child with a disability. If that child's off reserve and requires a, a stroller, a wheelchair, and a lift, that child will get all those items off reserve. But if you're on reserve, you only get one of those items every five years. And the lift is self-installed. How many, I don't know what their, their, their training on child development is, but 15 years in the lifespan of a child is a huge amount of time. This goes on, and it talks about other examples. One of the things that came up was orthodontic care. A kid on reserve only gets orthodontic care if they cannot eat or cannot talk. Cannot eat or cannot talk. This is an 11th richest country in the world. And uh, there's documents that say that really they encourage them to pull the teeth because it's cheaper for the government if the teeth are pulled versus getting the orthodontic care. And when you're at that stage, you can only apply for treatment. Um, you have to apply to federal government to get them to approve this orthodontic care. And this is a document we got from the federal government about how long it takes them to do those approvals. Uh, how many people here have had a root canal? 
How many here would like to wait another 40 days before they had it done? And that's the average, right? And we're talking about, we're here in this room, most of us are adults, but imagine if it was a child having to wait that period of time. This uh, document is actually, as you can see, dated 2014. So we're not talking about documents dated 20, 30 years ago. What about child welfare? One of the most dangerous things about discrimination is it becomes normal. Right? It becomes normal. We use words like overrepresentation. We know that over 70% of the children in child welfare care in Saskatchewan are First Nations and Métis kids. And that number just keeps going up and up and up. Now, you could say that because they're in child welfare care because their families aren't looking after them. But in fact, the evidence doesn't show that. First Nations children are not overrepresented in child welfare for abuse. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen and we need to own up to it. It's poverty, poor housing, and substance misuse. All things we can do something about. These kids are going into child welfare care because, as I'm about to show you, the First Nations child welfare agencies on reserve are significantly underfunded compared to all other organizations. They aren't able to provide those services to keep families together that all other Canadians get. And you can think about overrepresentation, as I say, by percentages, or you can think about it in hard numbers, or you can think about it the way children themselves think about it, which is, how many sleeps till I see my mom? One of the documents filed at the tribunal that literally took my breath away was a spreadsheet prepared by the federal government. It shows the number of nights in care that First Nations children on reserve in the Yukon spent in foster care between 1989 and 2012. If you added up all the columns, it was 66 million nights of childhood. 66 million nights. You know, I worked on the line as a child protection worker for 13 years, and I had a lot of talks with foster kids who taught me a lot, and they would always say the nights were the worst. He said, in the days we could keep ourselves busy. And isn't it true of all of us? Isn't it at night when those deep things come to our minds? 66 million nights away from their families. And here in Saskatchewan, it's close to 8 million. So when the government says, we're doing our best, we're rolling out things slowly. Children only get one childhood. They simply cannot wait. And when the government cannot do better, it's up to all of us to stand up and make sure they do better. It's all of our responsibility to demand that they don't allow another night to go on. And this number has grown, right? It grows by 8,000 sleeps every night because we still have that inequality. And that's where this, uh, this uh, case comes in. You know, um, we filed it in 2007, and uh, I'll never forget the day we filed it. We were a small organization. Most of our budget came from the federal government. And uh, although we have seen democracy, we were pretty clear that when we filed this, we probably wouldn't be seeing any more funding with the federal government. <laughs> and within 30 days, our prediction came true. 30 days. Uh, I was with the then National Chief Phil Fontaine, and we were in Parliament, and we filed it, and it was the most important, in my view, human rights case of its time. Think about it. What could be more serious than alleging the government of Canada is racially discriminating against little kids in foster care? There's not too much that you can do that's worse than that. And yet there was nobody there. I still remember walking down the street. Those of you who've been to Parliament know that Parliament Hill has steps. And I can still remember and I can still hear and will forever in my life hear the sound of my heels going down those steps. Where was everybody, I wondered? Do they think we deserve it? Was hockey on that night? Where are all these people that show up on Canada Day? Where are they? when the, the country's children need them. I could have believed a lot of things, but I've always believed in the goodness of people. And I thought if we created an opportunity to put all the Government of Canada's documents and all of our documents online, and we invited caring people to watch, to be a witness, to see what we have seen, 
that thousands of them will. And as you can see, thousands of them have. And one of the first witnesses, though, were not academics, they were not human rights workers, they weren't even student activists. Remember I told you our funding was cut 100%. We had $50,000 in the bank. We didn't even know how we're going to do this. This is the biggest law firm in the country, the government of Canada. They got lots of lawyers. It was about three weeks later, and I was wondering what I'd just done. And an envelope arrives in the mail. And it was addressed in pencil crayon to me. Now, I've come very fond of letters with pencil crayon. <laughs> Green pencil crayon. And I took it to my office, and as I was walking, it shook. And inside was a letter that I still have today. It says, Dear Cindy, here's some M-U-N-Y for the kids. Love, Ella. And inside was $1.67 from her piggy bank. From that moment, I knew we'd be okay. And to this moment, children are the largest numbers of donors to the Caring Society. We never ask kids to donate to us, but they own our organization. See, because children know fairness. And they came to the hearings, and they saw the government of Canada's arguments. They saw the government of Canada fight for six years to keep the truth and the hearings away from uh, the facts. And they saw the government of Canada lose on each and every one of those occasions. And when they would come, I would tell them that being a witness doesn't mean just listening to me and believing the inequalities. You have to go listen to the other side. What are the arguments on the other side? So, so many children started coming to the tribunal. By 2012, we had to move the hearings to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the children came in shifts. <laughs> Imagine yourself, the government of Canada, and these are your constituents. Now, what is it that a child would possibly understand about a complex legal proceeding like this? Well, I remember the security guy at the Supreme Court of Canada. When I first walked in, he was a bit nervous as all the yellow school buses pulled up the front. <laughs> and he says, this is a bit like a daycare today, isn't it? And then I saw him later that afternoon, and he said, you know what? He said, I have to tell you, these kids are better behaved than most of the adults who come to the Supreme Court. <laughs> and uh, the kids were there, and they were listening to Canada that day. Canada was arguing two things. One is, funding is not a service. We, as a federal government, only provide the funding to the social workers. So if the social workers are providing less of a service, it's them who are discriminating. That's argument number one on behalf of the federal government. Argument number two, it's unfair to us as the federal government. Now, I don't know. I, didn't, I wasn't worried too much about the fairness to the federal government when I filed those. <laughs> but anyway, it's unfair to them as a federal government to compare their level of funding to, the first, to provincial funding that non-Aboriginal kids get. And the kids were listening to this. And uh, I come out and there's this little boy and he has this piece of full scab. You know the tallies, one, two, three, four, five? <laughs> he has a whole long list on one side and a short list on the other. Now, he tells me two important things. He said, first of all, Cindy, in those bathrooms, there's marble in there. <laughs> you have to go look. This is a fancy place. He says, so now look at the sheet I got here. Do you know what this is? And you know when kids show you that thing that looks like a Rorschach ink blot and you're trying to be good and figure out what it is? <laughs> well, I've made lots of unfortunate guesses over the years, so now I just admit that I don't know. And I said, no, I don't know what your list is. And uh, he said, uh, well, I've been sitting here all day. I, told, I heard what you told me, that being a witness is like being a newspaper reporter, that I have to listen to all sides. So I was here today, and so I already listened to you before. I don't need to listen to you again. And uh, he said, the long list is when the judge asks the Canada people the question. And the short list is when the Canada people answered. <laughs> and another little girl was there with her younger brother. And for those of you who know me well, you know that unfortunately I've aged so much that I need reading glasses these days. And he had one of those t-shirts with a message on it. So I asked the little guy, I said, what does your t-shirt say? And he says, oh. He says, that says that the rules don't apply to me. And the older sister pointed to Canada's council and said, and they don't apply to them either. <laughs> don't apply to them either. 
So what is some of the evidence that the kids saw? This is a fact sheet that if you were on the Aboriginal Affairs website in 2007, as I would have, you would have read the same text. Uh, since we filed it at the tribunal, it is no longer available, but I have it for you here. This is a portion of the fact sheet. It says, First Nations Child and Family Service Agencies keep pace uh, with provincial and uh, territorial policy changes. And therefore, the First Nations Child and Family Service Agencies are unable to deliver the full continuum services offered by the province. A fundamental change is needed. This is the government's own website. Right? This is its own document showing that it should, knows what the inequality is. This is a document that's marked secret. It's not so secret anymore. Um, it was filed at the tribunal. And as the government, uh, if you read their public statements, they will talk about how much money they've spent on child welfare, and that's gone up. It has gone up because the number of kids in care have gone up. Um, but you can see behind me that in their internal estimates, this is how much they're short funding, right? And this is the evidence that went before the tribunal. And it's very difficult when your own evidence by your own employees is going against what you're saying. The government of Canada actually commissioned KPMG, an expert witness, to try and refute these claims we had of unequal funding. And so KPMG went about its work, and it came within 0.12% of our calculations. So the government's own expert witness agreed with us. We thank the government of Canada for funding that report, and we filed it as evidence on our side. <laughs> no witness was ever brought by the government from KPMG, needless to say. <laughs> now, you ever hear the story, it's like stealing candy from a baby? You know, we're talking now about the surplus and all this stuff. We want a surplus. That makes us all feel good. Uh, but where is all that money coming from? This is, uh, this is a document from uh, Aboriginal Affairs. I'm able to show it to you now because I actually just got it two days ago through access to information. And you can see here, um, this is how much they felt they needed to spend in child welfare funding. But they stopped spending money where that red line is. So what they've taken is $502 million directly from these vulnerable kids. They certainly haven't given it to vulnerable veterans, have they? So a half a billion dollars has gone away from the childhood of those 66 million nights. Money that you and I have contributed in taxes, many of our communities have given up in revenue. The other thing that we hear a lot about is, and uh, I think Reva pointed out really well, these inequalities echo across all areas of experience and education. And uh, we hear the federal government from time to time saying, we've got the education thing covered. Uh, we are announcing a new school. Who's heard the government of Canada announce a new school on a reserve? Uh, one of the documents that we got was very interesting. And it's this document. It not only confirms the inequalities across all areas of kids' experience, it says the inequalities are so deep, what the government of Canada is doing is they are literally announcing new money for schools and for dealing with water and housing, and then they're taking from that pool of money to deal with the shortfalls. So this money for schools is never really getting to build schools. And it's been happening to a, a very uh, significant value. You can see that's a half a billion dollars over a period of six years. And when this was brought up at the tribunal, I was asked as a witness by the tribunal members, well, isn't this kind of a good thing that they're trying to make up for the shortfall at least? And I said, well, if you think about it, the leading factors driving kids into child welfare care are poverty, poor housing, and substance misuse. So when you take money out of poverty, out of housing, and you make that problem worse, you actually create more of a demand for child welfare, right? It just makes sense. This is a shell game that's going on, right? And it is being done under the mask of we're doing the right thing. In fact, I just read a UN submission by the government of Canada where they're talking about First Nations child welfare. Uh, the only thing they don't really talk about is, oops, we're subject to a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal complaint that's about to be ruled on in three months. They talk about all, all the things that they've done, but not about all the things that they remain to be uh, done to achieve equality. 
Now, if you're the government of Canada and you're in this case, in the evidentiary case, and we, by the way, filed over 500 documents, and I really want to thank the Canadian Human Rights Commission and our own volunteer lawyers for having plugged this out with us, uh, and, the, and Amnesty International and the Chiefs of Ontario and the Assembly of First Nations. Now, if you're the government of Canada and you're confronted by all of your own documents showing the inequality and your own expert agreeing with the other side, then how are you going to deal with that in final written submissions? Well, this is the government of Canada's response to that. Basically, they're saying, don't pay attention to our, our employees because they're only expressing personal views. <laughs> and then, when uh, feeling that they're confident that they have dealt with that, they moved on to the question of the Auditor General's reports that confirmed these inequalities in 2008 and 11. And what they said is, give minimal weight to what the Auditor General says because the um, complainants and the commission did not call the Auditor General as a witness. But what we said is, well, we took a look at the Auditor General's Act and no one can call the Auditor General as a witness. And the other unfortunate thing for the department is when those reports are released, the department responds in writing to those, letter, those reports and they actually agreed with all the Auditor General's findings. So... This is what some of the kids who came to see the closing arguments thought. This is a teenage boy and he says, really on the basis of all the arguments, the caring society's got this case in the bag. I hope he's right, the ruling will happen by April. It marks the first time ever in the world where a national government's been put on trial for its contemporary treatment of children. The tribunal will make two decisions. It will decide first in is the government of Canada racially discriminating against these children? 163,000 kids. And if they are, the tribunal has the legal authority to order the government of Canada to implement a remedy. To implement a remedy. Now, this is where all of you come in. Because I suspect if they were to go unwatched, they would wait the 30 days for the news to die down and then they'd file an appeal. They want you to get busy listening to the Mike Duffy trial or maybe on to the hockey finals. They don't want you to be paying attention to this. But don't you think now's the moment? Don't you think you want to tell your kids that when that moment came, you were not silent? You were not the bystander looking for someone else to do the right thing? that you understood that the word Canada was a First Nations word that meant village. And when you thought of that word, you thought of fairness, and you realized that equality and freedom are not free. They never were. And that it is your responsibility to stand up and make this country even better than what it is. Because, you know... I said to the tribunal, I don't want you to rule in my favor, the Caring Society's favor, and please don't rule for the government. Make the best decision for the children, and everybody wins. And if you come to Ottawa, the kids, well, they're sending valentines to Prime Minister Harper. Same ones that were at the tribunal. They believe in a world that even if adults aren't doing anything, they're going to do something about it. So they write Valentine's so that First Nations children can grow up safely in their homes with their families, get a good education, be healthy and proud of who they are. And isn't that the world you want for your kids too? Uh, the great uh, U Regina uh, Indigenous uh, Students Association has a booth outside where you can send that Valentine. And uh, send it. Because... If we all actually did stand up, if we all actually took that moment to believe in our own power as a people, to be even better than what we are, to raise up an opportunity for our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children to never again to have to recover from their childhoods, and for a generation of non-Aboriginal children never again to say sorry, I can imagine walking with a little girl. Be walking by a big house, and she'll say, what do you, you see what they're doing there? I'll say, yes, they're laying sod. And she'll say, no, you're wrong. They're making it beautiful because what happens in that house is beautiful for children. We've got to make that happen while she's still a child. 
She deserves that dream and we owe it to her. You're the children's best hope. Reconciliation is in each one of you. Thank you for coming. you're all going to sign up. And this, by the way, is one of the Valentines Prime Minister Harper's going to get this year. It was just, just uh, made by some kids in Ottawa last week. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Thomas Bradle. I'm the Associate Dean Research and Graduate Studies uh, in the Faculty of Arts. And it's my distinct pleasure to thank Dr. Blackstock for... Um, well, I've been trying to come up with the right adjective. Uh, for, for, to describe this, this lecture, this talk, this imminently important reminder of what is central to our society. Um, and I'm still struggling to come up with the right adjective. Um, but I, I would like to, to, to thank you. Uh, this has been one of the most important lectures that I've heard here at this university. There's still an important part of uh, tonight's Woodrow Lloyd lecture to come, and that's the part that you play. Um, we have time for questions, and that Dr. Blackstock has kindly agreed to address them, uh, but she asks you to, uh, to frame these questions in general terms, uh, not to refer to, to individual cases and uh, keep the questions as, as general as possible. We have uh, two microphones in the aisles here. So uh, those of you who have asked questions, I would ask you to come to the microphone. Uh, then everybody in the audience will be able to hear the questions. Well, this means everything I said was right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I will say is we'll announce the ruling by Twitter. So you can follow us on at Caring Society. Uh, that's something all of you could do tonight, and uh, we'll announce it when the ruling happens. Please do retweet it out to people in your network. This is something everyone in the world should know about. So maybe we start uh, with the gentleman on the left. Here. Thank you. My, left. My name is Roger Ross, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. Dr. Blackstock, thank you very much, you. not just for tonight, but for everything you've done and the persecution that you've undergone to get to this point. Our community understands the sacrifices you've made. I have one comment, actually. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that there was a document that went missing off of the website uh, for ANDAC. In 2000, I put together a project, Aboriginal Healing Project, for Pasqua First Nation. And as part of that, I had to do some research on it. You also mentioned the Prime Minister's apology. Yeah. That document that I found on the ANDAC website, INAC at that time, was a document uh, based on the residential schools and the chronological history of the residential schools. The first residential school opened in 1620. How many years did the Prime Minister apologize for? 100 years. When the Aboriginal Healing Foundation released the funds, that document disappeared off of the INAC website. I downloaded it before they got rid of it. This is what our government's been doing. It's been hiding things that relate to our community. And I want to thank you for your bravery for bringing that out. And I wanted to offer that statement up because I've experienced it too. And it's impacting my children. It's impacting everybody's children. Yeah. And we need to put them first. And we have to learn how to do that again. Yeah. Because we've forgotten how as a society. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And one thing I should say, three cheers to the Aboriginal People's Television Network, who took the federal government to court to broadcast this entire hearing. So you actually can go onto the website and see every witness testify. And we were actually able to, uh, with APTN, we, took the, we had to get a tribunal ruling because the federal government didn't want you to see this tape. Uh, but with the closing arguments, we were able to live webcast them. And they really were watched all over the world. Because we said, really, these are not my children. They're your children. And you deserve to see firsthand what's happening in that room. All of that film is archived. It's a great resource for students and should be used, I think, really liberally uh, to share that whole story. And you can see it right there. They couldn't hide it anymore. Hello. First, I just want to say thank you to Elder Noel Starblanket for saying the opening prayer. I really respect um, learning from that man. I guess my question actually revolves around, we spoke about the idea of investing in our children at a young age, yeah. but you also touched base on the institu institutions that are being built and the massive number of youth and children that are in care, yeah. not in home, not at home, but they are actually in federal care or provincial care. Yeah. And we have a large gang epidemic here with First yeah. Nations communities across Canada and really in Regina and Saskatchewan right now. Um, what kind of, in your research, I guess, in your work, what kind of gang prevention or retention programs have you seen implemented that are still, that are very effective in bringing them back? And what role does First Nations culture, traditional culture, play in that healing process? Uh, culture is huge. Um, it's, uh, we were talking about it this morning with a group of students, and it really is a difference between growing up with your head down and your head up. And when your head's up and you feel like you belong to something, you're less likely to slip into the gang culture. And that's really why people do it. They do it for two reasons. One is they're poor. Um, the second is because they need to belong somewhere. And I think we need to do a much better job at ensuring this generation of children feel really proud and honored of who they are. The other is more practical. And we've actually advocated for in child welfare. There's a great program in the United States, for example, that uh, allows child welfare workers to give up to $14,000 in housing relief to at-risk families. And that could be used for first and last month's rent. It could be used for a washer and dryer. It could be used to refit a, a bathroom for a child with a disability. What did they find with that? Well, with $15 million that they parceled out, they saved 7,500 kids from going into foster care. And they saved the U.S. taxpayer $131 million. So when we meet people at where their level of need is, that's when we're going to see the difference. And that's what we need to do with this generation of children and young people. And the younger we get them, the better. Because when they get to being teenagers and they've lost their identity and they feel like they have nowhere to belong, then gangs are always a good option. And unfortunately, I agree with you. I've seen it across the country in my 20 years. That movement has grown and grown and grown because we haven't filled up the other side with lots of love and respect and honor for themselves. Thank you. Love, respect, honor. Okay, got it. Thanks. <laughs> Are we not working? Oh, there we go. Thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you for your visit and thanks for hearing all this. The question I have, and it's just a bit of a preface, I came from a city that was very racially and culturally singular, so we don't really have a worldview that is expanded. If you could have one message that each person in this crowd could take home to their friends and their family to share, something that can create one small voice into a very large voice, what would you have? What would you say to everyone should take with them from this? I would say if you believe in a world where every chance, uh, child should have a fair chance to grow up safely in their families, get a good education, be healthy and proud of who they are, then you need to stand up for the inequalities that First Nations children are experiencing. And if you don't believe they exist, at least try to prove people like Cindy Blackstock wrong. Thank you very much. The government of Canada has tried, they haven't succeeded so far, so. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Uh, thank, uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Mangwich, on behalf of the Indigenous Students Association. Uh, I also just wanted to mention to everyone here tonight that if you wanted to get involved in the Have a Heart campaign, it is here on campus yeah. from February 12th to 13th in the Aboriginal Student Centre, that's in the Research and Innovation Centre. Uh, there'll be letter writing, we need volunteers, 
Um, we need people to lead events. So if you're really interested in this campaign, come on down to the Aboriginal Student Center. We have lots of resources and a lot of great staff members and great students and great people. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Megwich. Thank you. And uh, you know, you're raising a really a very point that links back to that other young, man, young man's question. And that is, I think we need to teach kids that they have a voice that should be heard in the highest levels of our country. So the whole idea of Have a Heart Day is that they speak right to the person who has the power to make this different. And we've had young people come to the United Nations with us and speak firsthand. They don't need to speak through someone like me. Kids like Shelby, that eight-year-old who saw the sod, she knows exactly what to say. And when we give them the voice to speak to adults, that's when real change can happen. And we will get those addictions, those mental health centers, those cultural programs, and those family supports that we need. And sending one Valentine may not seem like very much, but I'm telling you, it is creating a world of change up in Ottawa. So thank you for, so much for all you do. First off, I'd like to thank you for everything that you do and inspiring all of us to do what we need to do. Um, a few of us were talking one day uh, a couple years ago when we, uh, we started hearing a lot more of what we were doing and you're bringing the situation to light, in, even to us as a people. Even though we knew that there was a problem, we just didn't understand the depth of the problem. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden we started talking and I said, well, when did poverty become a crime? Because we've, we started noticing exactly, so poverty has become a crime, so they're yeah. starting to take away our children. And the Child and Welfare Services has become the new Indian residential school because our kids are being taken on a huge basis and it's all just because of poverty, because of lack of housing, because of a lack of jobs, because of lack of education. So those are the reasons, and, and you've mentioned a few times, but do you feel that it's a fair statement that the child welfare system has become the new Indian residential school. There are more kids in, in child welfare than there was at the height of residential schools. And I think to the degree that those kids are going into care because they're being discriminated against by the government, that is absolutely parallel with residential schools. I think what we have to say, and I've always said this, is that I'm not an idealist. I know some First Nations children need to be in child welfare care, but not at 12 times the rate of everybody else and not for reasons that we could prevent. And uh, the crazy thing is, remember that graph, 11th richest in the world, and we saw that 1% with the uh, owning half the world's wealth? If we actually elected a government, and I'm not on one political party or another, if we actually elected a government that took that spirit level approach and realized that when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises, this country would be a lot better off. There's no excuse for any child in this country to have to go to a food bank for a meal. No excuse whatsoever. Hello. Thank you so much for um, being here tonight and for giving the, us these inspiring words and for all the many years that you've been doing this work. It's much appreciated. And I'm sure we're all very interested in the outcome of the April decision. Yeah. I'm sure, um, I wonder how you sleep at night trying to uh, not anticipate what will happen. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could describe what is the level of proof that is required to win that? Like what, what do you have to have proved? Proven, I guess oh. the word is. All right, well, we Reeve is here, she's a lawyer. I'm only in my first year of law school, or second year of law school. Uh, but this is, what I, this is what I understand, is that we have to, under the Canadian Human Rights Act, you can prove discrimination for two things. One is denial of a service, or adverse treatment. That means you get less of a service, or somehow more hoops to jump. We also, remember that word service? Well, the federal government is arguing that funding is not a service. And if it's successful, think about it. The federal government funds education in unequal ways. It funds housing in unequal ways. Basically, what it would do is immunize itself against any claims of discrimination because of its behavior, if it's successful with that argument. Thankfully, uh, remember I was telling you it spent six years trying to derail this thing? Um, the second argument it uses, which is the comparator argument, unfair, they say, to compare our level of funding with provincial level of funding. They tried to get the case dismissed on a preliminary motion on that basis. And the Federal Court of Appeal, which is one level below the Supreme Court, ruled against them. So that one is pretty much run out of gas. The live question is, 
the service. We think we defeated that at the tribunal. Um, we think what the, the tricky thing for the tribunal will be is the remedy. So they can order a remedy. The question is going to be, how specific can they be without raising an opportunity for the feds to appeal, but still be specific enough that the feds do something, right? Because if you leave it really general, like address the inequality, then we can all imagine 500 studies later, nothing's changed in children's lives. So that's going to be the very interesting legal point, is the remedy and how specific it is. Um, we were saying, this, there's no legal precedent for this case. There's never been a case come before the tribunal of this nature. So we will be creating a law. Um, we think it's fair to say that the federal government has discriminated. We believe that funding is a service because it directly impacts what's happening to children. And the other thing we say is that it would be absolutely against everything in Canadian society and human rights law to leave one group of people out of any human rights redress. But you can read the Government of Canada's factums all online. We've done summaries of them. So you can actually read their legal arguments firsthand. So Reva, did I do okay? A somewhat? Pretty good. You can talk to her later. Hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, Denise Bowden Anaquad, and I come from the Calves First Nation out by Broadview. And um, I go home when I can. Um, but uh, having a lot of discussion with um, many people who work um, in child and family services, and one thing that I didn't see in your data, and it just sort of came home to me, um, talking to a lot of my relatives, um, they said, Denise, the, 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 the dollar figure of, of most of the stats that you see are nowhere near because the the funding is so short that they don't include those people who take their can just because. And do you have any data for, like for, uh, you what, what would you guesstimate that sum of money to be? Um, if I had to guesstimate, I'd put a 30% on top of what they say. Because um, uh, uh, you're right. I mean, these are the government's uh, estimates, right? So these are the what I would say the low ball <laughs> estimates. Uh, but you can see, even at that, that is significant. Four hundred and twenty million dollars is not a small piece of change, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good news is we have something to build on. Remember that joint research, the KPMG came within 0.12 percent. That was participated in by just about every First Nations agency in the country. So it won't take us too long to figure out that added piece. And as long as we build a formula that has an overarching monitoring mechanism to make sure that we're accounting for those things over time, we may not get it right on the first brunch, mm -hmm. but let's keep it on the radar and make sure that this thing's equitable over time. In fact, one of the things we asked for in our remedy was actually an independent body to keep an eye on the department to ensure that their funding formulas are culturally appropriate and that they're equitable. They meet the needs of kids. And that would take account of those items that they haven't even thought of funding that other people are receiving. I thank you for the work that you do. I'm glad you're our advocate. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Because these uh, these uh, disparity gaps uh, been uh, on reserve for so many years and nothing has taken place to correct it, uh, do you think it's the, it's the uh, political organizations of First Nations being funded by uh, the government of Canada or the bureaucracy of uh, Indian Affairs? Do you think that could be a big reason? And do you think uh, First Nations should come together and create a political organization to advocate for uh, First Nations peoples on reserve and in Canadian society. Okay, thanks. Um, so all I can say is we were cut 100%, and uh, we were the first national organization to get zero funding from the federal government. I still don't get a dime from the federal government. Um, somebody wrote about our office, a journalist came into our office, and he said, he described it to the people he was writing about as, uh, a mix between First Nations art gallery and, kitchens, uh, and kitchen refrigerator. 
because it's filled with all these kids art and plastic cups and everything. I think that if you're going to take on something like this, you need to be smart about it. And the First Nations agencies were very smart. They created an organization not only to gather knowledge and educate and do all those things, but also when it came down to it, it was the one to take the hit. And that would be us. We had great advice from an elder. He said, never, ever fall in love with the Caring Society. And I would say this to anybody in an organization. Never fall in love with your organization. Never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the children. Because at some point, you might have to sacrifice both those things for them. And that day came for us. And what I would like to see eventually is a government that provides grants to First Nations and other groups that actually encourages dissent and, and democracy in this country and strive to crush it into an autocratic rule. That's where the problem is. But until then, you can come and see my kitchen refrigerator office. So all I have to say now is thank you. Uh, thank you to you for coming and for talking to us. And thank you uh, to you for coming out to the University of Regina, coming to this year's Woodrow Lloyd uh, lecture. And I wish you uh, good travels home. And I hope to see you all again next year. Thank, thank you. you very much.